Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The 2022 budget highlighted investments in Indigenous housing, children and families, and the further implementation of Jordan's principle. But there was one thing noticeably absent from budget 2022, and that's any mention of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. In 2021, MMIWG had its own section and a commitment of $1.6 billion over five years. The CEO of the Native Women's Association of Canada says this is raising serious alarm bells of where previously promised investments are going. There was a major flag for us in terms of you know, what, what happened with the investment in terms of the MMIWG. A national inquiry report was handed down with 231 calls for justice. And we're very concerned that on the surface of this reading of these uh, budget announcement, we don't see where the investment is going to be. And we have a very serious concern about that. There are a few short lines on addressing gender-based violence in this year's budget and funding for a national action plan for $539 million over five years. But that is for all women, not just Indigenous. Gru says NWAC to isn't against new funding for a gender-based violence program, but the government needs to state where MMIWG fits into that programming. Again, if there is a general gender-based violence uh, action plan and some, some investment there, there should have been a carve-out. There should have been a specific mention of MMIWG, Missing and Murdered, and Indigenous Women, what is the, what is the percentage that is going towards that? So it's, it's lumped into this general category. We don't know where it is, and we're probably going to you know, send some letters to try to find out where it is. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald says governments have a habit of funding studies but not following through on their recommendations. Why do they continue to create these studies? and then not fund them properly. That's a question for government. You know, to me, there's a design. There's a design that has been going on in this country from the beginning of our relationship with settlers, and it has to do with colonization. In a press release, Pauk Tutit Inuit Women of Canada says it's committed to working with the government on MMIWG initiatives. However, there needs to be more concrete action to achieve progress on the goal shared by the federal government and Pac Tutit to address the 46 Inuit specific calls for justice in the National Inquiry's final report. In an emailed statement, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Mark Miller's office says Budget 2022 continues to build on past investments to address the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls. And through the Federal Pathway Program, the government will invest in the calls for justice. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Baby eels are considered a delicacy in Asia, but this lucrative fishery in Nova Scotia is mostly in the hands of non-Indigenous harvesters. One Mi'kmaq man says it's his treaty right to earn a moderate livelihood. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans considers that illegal. So he took APTN's Angel Moore to a secret location to harvest them. Fabian Francis is harvesting baby eels, also known as glass eels or elvers. They're lucrative and can sell for up to $5,000 a kilogram. But what he's doing is illegal, according to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So he's constantly on the watch for fisheries officers. It's TFO across the road now, so we'll find out pretty, pretty soon. Uh, you know, it's TFO, RCMP, everybody's after us. You know, we, we can't even fish for our, you know, for our livelihood. Some Mi'kmaq communities are harvesting elvers under a government-approved management plan. This after DFO cut the commercial elver quota by 14 percent to increase access for Mi'kmaq First Nations. Eric Shiley, negotiator for the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, says it's necessary to monitor the elvers. So the concern becomes if we don't know what's being taken out, if we don't know, uh, if we don't have people monitoring while they're fishing and looking at what the stocks look like when they're coming up, then we're missing something where we're just waiting for it to crash and we don't want to see that happen. But Francis is from the Escazoni First Nation, not one of those who've accepted the government's plan. He says his community can't wait. 
a lot of the reserves is poverty, homelessness, um, suicide, you know, you got addictions. And, you know, people are doing this because, you know, they don't have any, you know, anything to look forward to, you know. Francis doesn't believe he's doing anything illegal, that he has a treaty right to earn a moderate livelihood. But as the night wears on, he's convinced fisheries officers are nearby. They're probably taking pictures, you know, whatever they're doing, right? You know, they'll come over and talk to us and they'll say, you know, they'll see the Elvers and, you know, they'll, you know, arrest me or whatever they're going to do to us. Fisheries officers do pull up along the bank of the river, so Francis dumped his catch to avoid charges. Uh, the FO showed up and changed the whole ball game. You know, I had to do what I had to do to protect me and my family, so I had to dump the Elvers. Um, Reluctantly, I wasn't too, uh, I didn't want to dump them, but then again, you know, I, I can't fight any, I can't fight my rights if I'm in jail or... Francis speaks with the officers. You know, why do I have to go around hiding like a, a criminal in my own ancestral territory? You know? So, uh, you guys, what are you guys going to do, charge me or are you guys going to no, let me go? What the officer says to him is barely audible. We just want to let you know that as fishery officers, yep. we enforce the Fisheries Act and regulations. But Francis says this is just a temporary setback, and it won't stop him from exercising his treaty right in the future. We lost our Elver catch, you know, five hours of Elver for nothing. You know, they, they, we had to dump it. And uh, I spoke to them, and I, I told them that I was going to go out and do it again. And uh, There is a couple of months left of the lucrative Elver fishery for the Mi'kmaq to earn a moderate livelihood. Angel Moore, APTN National News. Nova Scotia. A rally was held over the weekend in downtown Vancouver to draw attention to the soaring construction costs of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. APTN's Tina House has this story. It's time to warrior your out. It's time to... There's a time in your life you put your remote down, your Game Boys and all, everything else that you do and stand up. Over 500 people gathered at the Vancouver Art Gallery, many holding signs that express their disapproval of the ballooning costs of the construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. What first started as an estimated $5 billion to build, the energy giant has now announced that those costs have exceeded $21 billion and counting. With the federal government now the owner of the pipeline, taxpayers are on the hook for the final tally once it's built. Trudeau makes these ridiculous decisions that don't service to slay over to the Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada. It's crazy the destruction that it causes. Look what it's going to kill. Federal Court of Appeal judges, we told them that it's going to wipe out the resident orca whales. We'll side with the best interest of Canada, they say. They'll side with the best interest of the people's pockets are getting full with industry. That's what they're siding with. For those in attendance, it's not just about the soaring cost to build a pipeline they don't want, but it's also a major concern if there is a spill and the bitumen, which is like a thick tar-like substance, will sink to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Currently, there is no technology to clean that up, but only skimming the surface of the water. Scientist and activist David Suzuki says climate change is a reality and major projects like the Trans Mountain is an example of how fossil fuels is adding to that crisis. They have now approved, they've approved despite the IPCC report, despite what the UN Secretary General has said, they've approved the Betador pipeline, opening it up. This is absolute. We have to stop that. We have to stop the Trans Mountain. Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and his wife Joan say that this pipeline will never be built. And we all share the same passion, the same love for Mother Earth and the uh, birthright of our children and grandchildren. And that will never diminish. We will never abandon our sacred responsibilities to the land and to the water and to our future generations. And if there's any nation along the route that says no, it's no. And at the break in the line, how are they going to get it there? Pam Pometer was also at the rally. 
She says that the project is not profitable. And they said, okay, it's only going to cost four and a half billion. And the whole project will be seven and a half billion. And then the prices kept going to 12 and a half billion. And we have a parliamentary budget officer who said it is now not profitable. And that was when it was 12 and a half billion. The mechanical portion of the pipeline is expected to be completed in 2023. Once built, approximately 1 million barrels of bitumen will be sent from the Alberta tar sands to the Westridge dock in Burnaby, BC, and then loaded onto supertankers bound for Asia. Tina House, Apertian National News, Vancouver. We want to hear what you think about the stories you've seen so far tonight on our news. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Cases of avian flu in geese have been confirmed across Canada, but goose break, the Cree goose hunt, is still a go. While the risk of avian flu spreading from birds to humans is low, it can pose a threat to poultry flocks. Here's Amelia Fournier with more. Across the country are monitoring their poultry closely. The Cree Trappers Association and the Cree Health Board advise goose hunters to take extra precautions, including avoiding visibly sick birds, changing clothes after hunting or preparing meat, frequent hand washing, and handling their game outside or in a well-ventilated area. It is safe to go hunting. This is our message for our for our people that it, it is safe to go hunting, you know, but you know, the precautions you take are, you know, to make sure that you, you, you check the surrounding areas if there's any avian flu or avian cases in the area. We need to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, the Paul First Nation in Alberta has made some changes, and it's for the better. Welcome back to APT National News. The man who helped Northern Airlines merge has abruptly left his job and Canadian North is in need of a new CEO. Canadian North is the one airline that services all of Nunavut and much of the rest of the Arctic. It was formed in 2018 with the merger of First Air and Canadian North. At the time, Chris Avery, then president of First Air, was named CEO of the new Northern Airline Monopoly. Now Avery has suddenly resigned and Canadian North has named a temporary CEO. Canadian North operates 31 aircraft and are often the only way to enter or leave northern flying communities. Canadian North did not immediately return our request for comment on Avery's departure. The Paul First Nation in Alberta has been under a co-management order from Indigenous Services Canada for about two decades. But that's all changed for the better. Chris Stewart tells us how. Members of Paul First Nation have gathered to celebrate being removed from a default management plan instituted by Indigenous Services Canada. Chief Arthur Rain says that since 2002, the band has been on a co-management plan with one brief period where they were independent, but quickly were put back on co-management. The way the, uh, the IC uh, explained their concern was uh, we may have... Uh, you know, violated the, uh, their uh, funding agreement. And we also violated our own uh, management action plan because we're in co-management just trying to come out. So we had a management action plan that we may have not followed. Wanda Arkan Whitford of Kowasic Management helped Paul First Nation manage the band finances and become independent with conditions. The group was brought in to co-manage. Chief Rain says now they can move ahead. Well, there's a positive outlook for uh, future Paul First Nation. We have a lot of plans in place that uh, they do take form and materialize. It's going to be cash flow for the band. Chief Rain says he expects not to go back to co-management. 
we just sort of keep to ourselves our accomplishments and failures, but I think in terms of uh, uh, transparency, what we're doing and nothing to hide, we, you know, we mess up, fix it up, hopefully we don't mess up again. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Stony Plain, Alberta. We need to step aside for one more break, but coming up, a preview of a new episode of Face to Face. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our viewer Ken Welsh sent in this wonderful close-up of a fully blossomed tulip from his kitchen table in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Send your photos by email to share at aptn.ca. Send in your family, friends, wildlife, sunsets, epic meals, cute pets, all things wonderful and amazing for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting over in the east, 7 degrees in Charlottetown and 12 in Halifax. Zero degrees and some snow in Maine and four in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Six degrees in Val d'Or and eight degrees in Quebec City. Six in Rain in North Bay and eight degrees in Sault Ste. Marie. Six degrees in Timmins and minus three in Big Trout Lake. Minus 11 in Churchill and one degree in Thompson. Snow as part of that big blizzard in Winnipeg and zero and minus three in Dauphin. Minus 6 in Saskatoon and minus 6 in Swift Current. Minus 7 in some snow in Stony Rapids and minus 8 in snow in Buffalo Narrows. In the west, minus 9 in Fort Chippewan and minus 4 in High Level. Minus 7 in Edmonton and minus 7 in some snow in Calgary. Plus 9 in Campbell River and plus 10 in Bella Coola. Minus 2 in Clear in Dees Lake and plus 4 in Sandspit. Minus 6 in snow in Old Crow and minus 1 in Mayo. Minus 5 in snow in Norman Wells and clear in minus 1 in Fort Simpson. Plus 1 in Fort McPherson with some snow and minus 7 in Colville Lake. Minus 12 in Cambridge Bay and minus 15 in Baker Lake. Minus 17 in Resolute in snow and minus 19 in Arctic Bay. When it comes to boutiques, Les Artisans Indiens de Quebec is among the last of its kind. The not-for-profit arts and crafts store is owned and operated by Huron Wendat people and Wendake. More on that in this story from February of this year by Chouchon Becon, translated for us by Lindsay Richardson. Bonjour, Michel. Hey, Les Artisans Indiens du Québec is the kind of place that has a following. If you're a First Nations artisan, you'll find much of what you need here. Leather, fur, feathers, and of course, beads. Lots and lots of beads. Elle a été fondée en 1974. C'est issu d'un programme euh, du ministère des Affaires indiennes à l'époque qui visait à soutenir tout le domaine du socio-économique de l'artisanat autochtone au Canada. Alors c'est un programme qui a été euh, sur place pendant une vingtaine d'années et, et des corporations comme nous, il y en a ouvert à l'époque une vingtaine au Canada quand même. Et euh, début des années 90, le gouvernement met fin à ce programme-là. Fait que les corporations comme ça ont tous fermé, sauf la note. Ah bon, I have to shop là. Yves Picard is here on Wendat and is the director general of the store. He credits his mainly indigenous clientele across Canada for keeping the business going. According to Picard, about 70% of his clients are from outside Quebec, so all his employees have to be fluent in French and English. Supply, how can I help you? Among their repeat customers is none other than Michelle Odette, the Inu Canadian senator. Odette doesn't like to order over the phone or online. She needs to see and feel the material she buys. She became acutely aware of this when the store was closed for six months during the pandemic. Do you still have the wood, là? La perle représente pour moi une histoire, un esprit, un être humain ou quelque chose, un moment dans ma vie. Et j'habite ici, j'habite dans cette région-là. 
Et avant la COVID, je, 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 je venais folle ici. Je, venais, je perdais tous mes sens parce que j'apprenais à perler et je voyais là, ce qu'il y avait. En dos du médaillon, ben, on a des petites retailles qu'on ah. conserve. Fait que ça peut être... Au lieu de manger tout mon beau cul. Exactement, on a plein de petites retailles. Odette aussi also appreciates the personalized advice that comes from employees who are First Nations, as well as their patients. Parce que j'ai besoin, soit parce qu'on nous a appris à observer, et à toucher, à sens sentir ou ressentir, mais c'est en venant ici, là, on me laissait faire. On me laissait là, taponner les sacs, quasiment les sentir, jouer avec les fils, brasser des affaires, ouvrir des tiroirs. Je vais t'en racheter parce que c'est avec ça que j'ai fait. But not everyone has the same needs as Odette. We will pelt, yes, of course. Uh, do you want one inch and a half or two inch? In a world where many do their shopping online, the store needs to compete. Là, là c'est beau, ça. So, Picard used the time off early on in the pandemic to get a website up and running. And so far, the little artisanal shop that could keeps on going. In two years, it will be their 50th anniversary. Je profite de l'occasion pour euh, remercier encore euh, toutes les communautés euh, du Québec et du Canada. Et euh, on vous invite à venir nous voir, venir, nous, venir voir nos produits. On est toujours là pour desservir euh, euh, notre clientèle privilégiée qui sont les Premières Nations du Québec et du Canada. A story by Shishan Bacon, APTN National News, Wendage, Quebec. Dennis Ward will have a new episode of Face to Face tonight. Here's a preview of what's to come from his conversation with Stéphane Richard. Starting with just operations, uh, a knee operation, an elbow operation, a nose operation for breaking my nose, uh, I had a tooth kicked out, number of concussions. Um, some mornings, I, you know, my back hurts so much that I have to get my partner to pull my legs to get me out of bed. So it was uh, pretty immense. But, you know, at the same time, do I regret it? No, I don't. I feel this way because I, I chose to live, you know, the lifestyle of being a pro wrestler. But a major spring blizzard is expected to hit southern Manitoba tonight with the potential to be the worst in decades. I know people living in Winnipeg are resilient and tough and they're used to poor weather, but this is a system that we don't often see. Um, you know, we call it a one in a 30 year event. The storm is expected to last for three days and dump up to 80 centimeters of snow in some areas by the time it's over. Even though it's almost mid-March, residents are taking it in stride. I'm quite prepared. I just have to wait for the snow. It's pulling out the winter mitts and just let it go with the flow, I guess. Environment and Climate Change Canada says this week's snowstorm is on track to see similar snowfall to April of 1997. And in mid-March, of course, I meant mid-April. That's all we have for you tonight on EPTN National News. Stick around. A new episode of Face to Face with Dennis Ward is coming up. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us, and have a great night.